It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Something prehistoric surfaces in your mind. A sense that had been refined and ingrained ever since the days our ancestors spent smacking rocks together in caves. That nagging feeling causes the hairs on the back of your neck to prick up. Suddenly, the calm and inviting forest takes on a different shape. Trees that were once plush and green appear as if their branches are reaching out to grasp you, the ground crunching underneath you with each step, a constant noise that you would swear you're hearing too often, something walking in tandem with you. A howl pulls your attention. When facing the noise's conductor, you assume it's a bear. As it takes a step forward, however, It reveals itself as so much more. The hulking beast steps forward, dark fur meshing in with the bark from the trees. Hot breath rolls out of a heaving mouth. Red eyes that seem to emit their own light are fixated on you. And suddenly, you recognize what you've been feeling. The sixth sense of being watched by a predator. You also realize if the monster before you thought that you might be able to outrun it, then it wouldn't have been so bold. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. This week we are discussing the Ozark Howler, a predatory beast that roams the Ozark Mountains at night. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com. And be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow. And hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. You can now find Freaky Folklore videos on YouTube as well. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. A heavy plume of air rushed out of Casey's lips as he pulled his face away from his pair of navy green binoculars. Feelings of frustration were starting to find their way into the cracks between the patients he had at the start of the day. Every time he pulled his face away from the binoculars, he would get a small but passing headache, like when he used to sit in the optometrist's office. Which one looks better? Casey said to himself in a hushed voice, knowing full well he shouldn't be talking. One. He looked out past the brush in front of him. Or two. He spoke again. This time raising the binoculars to his eyes. A vision suddenly zooming in to reveal the same scene he had been looking at for at least a good hour. Still nothing. His words were steeped in exhaustion. The aches of stillness were beginning to remind him of how long he had been laying on the forest floor. His legs were cramping and his fingers were moving stiffly. He hated the thought of rising from a good spot, but he hadn't seen any worthwhile movement since he laid down. A few deer and small mammals crossed his path, but none of them were worth using a bullet for. Deciding it was best to stretch and reposition, Casey's body lumbered to life like an old cog-driven machine. Rising through the brush, Casey heard the soft skittering of smaller mammals retreating from the potential predator. Looking around at the foliage and high-reaching trees, Casey was once again reminded of just how alone he was. He wondered if any other hunters were nearby. He wondered if they were the reason he was struggling to find meaningful game. 
pivoting his arms, the rifle that was previously gripped on his left hand swung around and rested on his back, strap pulled tight on his chest to keep it from falling. He hated to abandon the spot. It looked like it should be perfect. There was a dip in the landscape leading to a small clearing in the trees, just enough to create a patch of muddled sunlight. One could easily picture wildlife trotting through the patch of unafflicted grass. The patch was also fairly close to the trailhead, which would make for an easier walk back. But it dawned on Casey, if the spot was as good as it seemed, there would already be a blind set up in it. So with the roll of his eyes that could have knocked him over, he grabbed his rucksack and ventured on from his temporary home. He had heard from a friend back home what a wonderful place the Ozarks were for folks who wanted to go a hunting. A variety of wildlife and plenty of room to play with for someone like Casey who just wanted to get away from honking horns and hiking rents. It did sound like a dream. A few impulsive decisions and savings draining expenses later and Casey was all packed up and on the road. Before he knew it, he had developed a small life for himself. A modest home and friendly neighbors were all Casey needed to feel like all those days spent crunching numbers for hedge fund kids were worth it. Before all the stock trading and company trending, Casey's father used to take him hunting. He taught him how to hold a rifle, when to shoot, where to shoot, and when not to take the shot. It was those days that drove Casey back into the long reaching arms of the forest. After losing his father, all he could do was stare out of windows and daydream, longing to spend just a few more minutes out in the woods with his father. And so he walked, distancing himself from the patch of brush he was laying in. Each step brings its unique sound and texture. A different pattern of fallen leaves and varied mounds of dirt caused a forever changing foothold. Casey kept his senses focused, having long since learned that the scariest predators are the ones you can't hear coming. One of the great things about hunting in the Ozarks is the variety of game you can find along the large stretch of green. All this variety goes all the way to the top. Just because there weren't any recorded violent incidents between men and bears doesn't mean Casey was aching to be the first, especially with the knowledge of the number of bear sightings that were on the rise. He recalled the locals telling him stories about mountain lions and cougars, or panthers, as the locals called them. He thought about large cats stalking him, weaving in and out of trees, quick and meaningful steps, eyeing any piece of exposed flesh that he offered a view of. So he kept vigilant, listening to the scurrying of small critters, ones that could be followed by larger critters watching for hungry eyes peering between the trees or for noticeable rustlings of the foliage. His father would mock him for being so paranoid and trekking through the woods, something he had done more times than he could count, though only recently have begun to do it so alone. As he marched, watching the rays of sun peeking through the canopy become grayer, he continued to think back on the conversations he had with his neighbors. They were all talkative when he mentioned that he had moved to the Ozarks to go hunting. Everyone had a story to tell him. He'd share a drink and a laugh as some older couple regaled their story of a romantic evening turned frantic escape from Bigfoot. Of course, Casey thought, if there's a big enough patch of wooded land, then naturally there's Bigfoot running through it. He chuckled to himself, feeling a short jolt of fear that passed when logic swarmed back in but it brought to his attention just how much he hadn't been paying attention. He was walking for longer than he intended. Turning around, he saw the earth behind him rising like a mossy wave. The decline was subtle while walking down it, but very noticeable seeing it all laid out in front of him. Oops, he said aloud, almost mocking himself. Reaching his arm behind him, he rummaged through his belongings and retrieved what he always thought looked like a cartoonishly big walkie-talkie. It was a satellite phone with information about his coordinates displayed on the screen that looked like an old calculator. That plus the emergency satellite GPS beacon he kept on him eased the worries about not being able to make it back. He had written down the coordinates where his 4x4 was parked, all he would have to do to get back to those numbers 
or hit the beacon in worst case scenario. He wasn't too far from where he started, maybe a two hour walk, though the uphill portion would present a challenge. Surveying the area quickly, Casey still didn't see a good spot for him to hide. The trees were too dense where he was and not enough ground cover offered by the bushes. If he kept following the decline in the landscape, he thought he'd either run upon a clearing or a river, which would offer ample activity. Aware of the slope now, Casey felt it with each step, further and further into the ravine. Only his patience carried him forward, but he could sense it. A river was nearby. The way the air was going into his nose felt more compact, carrying that familiar scent that only natural running water could provide. He figured it wouldn't be that far off. Supplies stuffed back into the sack they were pulled from. Footsteps resumed. The sensation of moisture in Casey's mouth built with each breath, momentarily stilling the belief that he was heading toward the river. This belief, a quick flickering in his mind, was snuffed out when his vision became hazy. Casey cursed to himself. He had done a once-over of the weather conditions before leaving that morning. Everything indicated that the weather was meant to be clear, with a bit of cloud cover here and there, but mostly blue skies. There certainly wasn't anything about the fog that he was watching roll in on him. The change lacked subtly, or maybe Casey had missed the early meetings of the mist. Maybe he could have seen the small, swirling gray wrapping around his ankles through the climbing grass, but it was too late now. He could see it bearing down on him like a hot and heavy breath offered by the woods itself. A wall of dense fog approached. The Ozarks were no stranger to fog, but getting so hazy so fast? He was unsure if there was even a strong enough breeze to carry it like that. Before being able to decide to press on or make the trek back up the hill, Casey was smacked with a wall of fog. He could practically feel the weight of it when being surrounded as if it might wash him away. Each breath carried the sensation of accidentally swallowing too much of your drink. The urge to cough nearly suffocates you. The hill to safety was obstructed. He could see a few feet in front of him, but anything after that was a haze. Trees looked like people looming in the distance, their arms held high in the air, giving Casey the sensation of being watched. The feeling of pinpricks nestling the back of his neck. His mind got muddied experienced trouble adapting to sudden shift in environment and mood. A calm jaunt to the river, warping into an alien landscape. The forest feels more imposing than it ever had as a kid. Calm down, buddy. It ain't all that. He reaffirmed himself, trying to gain a grasp on the situation. Just ahead, back up the hill. The base isn't that far away. He moved his right foot forward, the ground was becoming moist, dirt giving way under his weight. It felt more like swimming than walking, the fabric clinging to his skin. He swam through the air, drops of water sticking to his skin. It was impossible to differentiate between sweat and condensation. Every tree he walked by, the distant silhouettes would put him on edge. The conversation about Bigfoot once again plagued his thoughts, though more sinister now. His mind considered everything that could go wrong, what potential threats might use the fog to stalk him. Then he remembered, not too many people brought it up, but enough for its name to stick. The Ozark Howler. A woman in the grocery store, a young couple on their porch, a school teacher, and a few other folks, all gave him bits and pieces about the beast. Another tree sat idle as he passed. A large body, looking similar to a bear, with muscles that would be able to rip apart anything and anyone. More still figures, twisting their way up, puncturing the cloud around him, vanishing into the reaches above, seaweed in the open air. He heard the howler had antlers, or was it horns? Or perhaps, protruding ears like a lynx. The details all blurred together. The voices he remembered, layering on top of one another until a vague vision of a stocky beast was all that Casey's mind could muster. As the trees continued waving their farewells, Casey could feel the squish beneath his feet, 
The muck beneath him was making the terrain more difficult than he anticipated. He'd have looked back to see how far he made it, but there wasn't little chance the fog would offer him such a view. You're being an idiot. A scream cut his words short, catching them in his throat and pushing them down into his stomach. There was no telling what direction the scream had come from. It faded in and out in one smooth motion. Frantically, his head turned, trying to get his bearings on an environment that gave no sight beyond outstretched arms. A quick patter rang in Casey's chest as a flock of shadows darted toward him. Just as he reached back for his rifle, the shadows got close enough to be identified as a small group of deer. One was larger than the rest, a size that might have been worth stalking in better circumstances. He wondered if the buck had emitted that noise, but that scream was too deep, still rattling bones. They dashed by, only paying attention to the path ahead. They didn't seem to note Casey's presence at all. He couldn't help but get the sensation that they were fleeing. The herd vanished as soon as they arrived. Their figures were swallowed up by the fog that showed no intention of thinning out. He again looked around, head turning slowly. Hello? Casey shouted into the void. Worried another hunter might have been what spooked the deer. Worried that his figure might be mistaken for one of them. Each tree's shapes need to be given once over to determine it wasn't a person. Anyone out there? He shouted again, wondering just how far his voice could travel in the dense air. He raised his hands, trying to make his figure stand out against the noise. There was a brief silence after his words dissipated. Then a sharp and abrupt smacking rang out nearby. Casey mistook the noise for a bullet piercing a nearby tree. So when he turned his head to face the impact, he felt his heart race. Sitting by the bottom of the tree was the limp and matted corpse of a small white bunny. Stepping a little closer revealed more intimate details about the sudden cadaver that had invaded Casey's pocket of the forest. Leaning in, Casey could see deep gouges in the bunny's stomach. It looked like the thing stepped directly in front of a shotgun barrel. The dark red rings were depressed like something had clamped down on it. Looking up revealed a crimson Jackson Pollock painting, the blood being dragged down the wet and slick tree bark, following the grooves in the bark, creating veins. The bunny hardly presented as such, with only moments of being on the ground. Blood ran until all white fur was covered. Looking to his left, he could see small drops resting gingerly on nearby leaves. He stared at the hints of blood, a line marking where the body came from. He watched the heavy fog, realizing that the sound he had heard was the rabbit hitting the tree. To make that much noise, whatever threw it was big. Another howl sounded the dinner bell. This time it was much closer to him. The conductor of the scream stepped into view. Its silhouette pressed against the fog. It all bore down on him, the feeling of being watched, the scarcity of nearby wildlife, even straight down to the almost supernatural rolling fog. The large dark mask hung a few paces away now. Even through the murky vision, he could see what looked like brake lights, the unflinching gaze of the Ozark Howler. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. 
Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. Official sightings of the Ozark Howler begin in the 1950s, though stories were being passed down that would date the beginnings of the legend in the 1800s. One of the most interesting things about the Howler is just how vague and contentious the aspects of its appearance and namesake Howl are. From sighting to sighting, it seems each story carries its variation of the beast. It's generally agreed to have a large and stocky body like that of a bear, and is cited to be covered in short black fur. It has different features depending on who is telling the story, most commonly sporting thick horns protruding from the side of its head. Other stories imply they are antlers, and some even recount the beast having bat-like wings. The beast howl also seems to change from story to story. Some say the howl sounds like a mix between a fox and a deer, or that it sounds like the scream of a human woman that is mixed in a guttural howl, while others claim that the sound was wholly otherworldly, a peculiar sound that they can't get out of their heads. Theories on what the howler is, like any cryptid or folklore, vary wildly. Some believe the beast to be a protector of the forest, a supernatural being that uses its heavy frame to keep threats away, using its paralyzing scream to ward off those who might harm it. Others believe that the Howler is a malevolent force, an angry beast that stalks around waiting for unsuspecting victims to venture off the beaten path. Some even believe that the origins of the Howler don't originate from the Ozarks. As mentioned, there were stories about the Howler that dated back to the 1800s. As it turns out, in the mid-1800s, settlers from Ireland, Britain, Wales, and Scotland would bear roots in the Ozarks. When they carve paths through the lands to find a new homestead, they would also bring with them their stories. Stories about hounds that stalk the highlands, looking for souls to guide them into the afterlife. The creature was called the Coo Sith. It took on the appearance of a wolf and was the size of a bull. While this creature was known by different names across the cultures that mingled, details did carry over. It was a legend that the Ku Sith would let out three howls, never more, never less. These howls could be heard from near and far, the piercing cry even reaching out to the sailors at sea. It was believed that these cries were a warning of sorts. Anyone who was able to hear the Ku Sith should seek shelter before the creature reached the third howl. Is it possible that the story of this legend bled over, mixing in with the folklore of the natives that resided there? Tales of supernatural cats and guarding deities mingling until no one could make heads or tails of it, become a new beast unto itself. Like many legends, whispered from one mouth to the other, until every bump in the woods, every howl at the moon, could strike fear into the hearts of those traversing the woods alone. People like the soldiers who made a homestead in 1946 at Red Oak, Oklahoma, trying to build a life for their families, the soldiers returned and started to build housing for expected population growth. The soldiers believed that something local didn't much care for their settling down. They reported sightings of what looked like a bulked-out cat stalking around the premises, its red eyes glowing as it watched them. Some of the old hunters likened the noise it made to that of a bugling of a deer, only more guttural. Another group, more modern, was exploring an abandoned amusement park called Celebration City in Missouri. The hikers were exploring the amusement park late at night when they heard what they initially thought was just the wind. As the noise continued and grabbed their attention, they looked towards the source to see a cat-like creature with, again, glowing red eyes. The hikers quickly vacated, but the story was enough to drum up the attention of people in the city who started exploring the park in hopes of catching a glimpse of the Howler. Even the guide for a group of explorers, Bill Thompson, has stated, I don't believe in monsters, but we saw something I can't explain. 
A more detailed account of interaction with the Howler comes from a student who had transferred from Memphis. The encounter takes place in 1927, on an unnamed road somewhere west of Little Rock. I was on a thin road, barely wider than a footpath, completely surrounded by dark forest, when suddenly a large dark figure jumped across the road in front of me. I was alarmed, to say the least, and immediately stood still to consider what I'd seen, wondering if I should investigate. Stepping forward slowly, I looked around to the side of the road for any sign of movement or sound. As my eyes were adjusting to the dark, I thought I could see a large looming figure atop of a rise, around what I estimated to be a few yards from where I stood. I didn't know what to make of it, seeing only the still outlines of the silhouette. I noticed it slowly moving toward me, which gave me enough reason to hurry forward on my way. I knew that I still had about two miles to go before the nearest neighbor who might let me in. Before I began walking again, though, I lit my lantern so that I could see the way more clearly. That's what I told myself anyway. I think I just felt safer with a light as if the brightness would protect me from that creature in the darkness. I began to see more clearly at the edge of the warm light what I could only describe as a somewhat feline face, but with dark and long shaggy hair, as well as large yellow eyes that were focused on me. Without thinking why, I thrust my lantern out in front of me before the creature could get any closer. With my heart beating fast, I began walking down the road again as fast as I could, it followed, I am sure of that, but the beast never attacked. The last I saw of it, when I pressed on the gas, was a blur, followed by a guttural howl as I quickly put distance between us. There is also, like any local legend, a wealth of uncredited reports from people living close to the densely wooded areas, like in 2006, Oregon County, Missouri. A friend of mine got up very early in the morning, about 4.30 a.m., and when he went outside, he noticed his livestock were very frightened and had huddled in a cluster in the corner of the fence by his house. He had some binoculars, so he took a look in the direction from which they had run. He said what he saw looked like a big black panther. He quickly changed his mind when he began walking down to his field and saw the thing running along his fence line. He said it had very long ears, or horns, and was black with thick fur. It had a long tail like a cat, but looked like a mix between a cat and a dog. It was broad, and about as big as a Great Dane. And it had eerie reddish eyes that gave him chills. There's no reason for him to make up such a story, and he was very shaken up after the sighting. This was in Oregon County, Missouri. There is also this detailed report that comes out of Southern Missouri submitted at an unknown date. The account will be edited down for brevity. We will begin the report where the interaction with what is believed to be the Howler begins. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But still, I had the feeling of being watched. More intense than I had ever felt it. The only thing I could liken it to was when I was doing mountain treks in Wyoming. I felt the hair on my neck stand on end while I was going around a glacial lake, and my mind said, there it is, turn around. When I did, there was the tail of a mountain lion slinking into the bushes. I trusted my senses then and now. Here I was on home ground feeling like ten lions were around me. I stayed put until I felt like there was nothing there, and then chalked it up to jitters. The woods felt different because of the extra rain. As I left the woods and crossed through the fog near the creek, I felt it again. Not as intense, but again my mind called out, There it is, turn around. At the edge of the woods was a man, dressed in dark mechanics pants and a red and green flannel jacket. Poachers were a problem for a poor family. We hunted, not to support only ourselves, but others that couldn't afford to buy meat regularly. So I began walking up to confront him. He turned and made for the woods. He made it to the fog bank at the forest edge, and I yelled out for him to stop. He kept walking and just seemed to dissipate in the fog the further he got into it. 
By the time I caught up to where I last saw him, there was nothing, no tracks, no disturbed foliage, nothing. I always thought it was odd that someone would wear flannel in the summer. The summer continued, and odd occurrences continued to happen in the woods. Neighbors all around us reported dead dogs, cats, small farm animals, and the occasional cow, all mutilated and chewed up. That constant feeling of being watched. I usually only carry a rifle in hunting season, but I started carrying one constantly later that summer. When fall hit, I turned 16, and things just got worse. Tracks started showing up on our neighbor's land that representatives from Fish and Game swore were grizzly bears. The only bears in Missouri are black bears, and all on the southeast side near the mountains and swamps. Tracks showed up on our land, too. Two big sets, front and back. The front seemed to be long like a dog's, but wide near the front like a cat's. And no claw marks told me that if it did have claws, then they retracted. The rear paw marks were wider, like the animal had massive rear legs for pouncing, and the paws to support it. I'm tearing up as I remember this. I bent over and began walking through the cedars, and my mind said, There it is. Turn around. I looked left, to the east, and near a thick patch of cedars was a freshly killed deer. The thing behind it was huge and black, crouched on all fours like some kind of big cat, but with big yellow eyes, bigger than I've ever seen, and a thick shaggy mane that flowed from just behind its head to the middle of its back. It wasn't a lion or cougar or bear. I've never seen anything like it since. I began walking sideways, determined not to take my eyes off of it. With each of my steps, a guttural purr came from it. The purr would start low like a growl, and then end on a high note. I slowly moved my rifle from the sling to my shoulder, so I could pull up quickly and shoot if I needed to. It was so big, I didn't know if I would have done any damage. It didn't move, though. I kept moving sideways until I was at an angle from it, and then backed up and out of the cedar thicket. I stayed bent so I could look at it until I moved out of sight. It just lay there and turned its massive head. As I got out of eyesight, I began to hear movement from the direction I'd just come, and the intense feeling of being watched. It was stalking me now. Here I was, 16 years old, probably going to die. They had find me later, or part of me, gnawed on with giant claw marks through my body. I'm 25 now, and in all my encounters with dangerous animals, I have never run. I ran then, and if it happened again today, I would run. I never run. Never, you understand? Bears, mountain lions, moose, never. But that thing was not all natural, so I ran. I continued south to get into clear space, get a clear shot, and get into open space so your body is easier to find. I made it to the old truck. The moss had dried up and was falling off. As I ran up to it, the man in flannel stepped out from behind one of the trees that was growing through it and pointed towards the trail out of the woods. I turned immediately and sprinted as hard as I could. Whether it was in my mind or actually happening, I felt like a hot breath was hitting my back. And then when I broke into the edge of the woods, the most unearthly scream sounded out from behind me. Half human almost. I kept running until I felt I was clear and then turned. Nothing. Nothing had followed me out. A shadow on all fours stalked about 100 feet deep through the woods. I made for the house as quickly as I could. When I got back, my dad was sitting at the kitchen table waiting for me. He had been out chopping wood that morning while I was running from the howler. He had heard the scream. He told me he had only heard it one other time. About 20 years before, he was out chopping a tree down near the edge of the woods, on the north side near the cedar grove. When he walked back to the truck to refill the chainsaw, he heard the same scream. He turned 
and the black thing had jumped up on the tree he had just chopped down and stood there looking at him. Dad left the chainsaw in the truck bed, got in and drove away. That tree is still on the ground today. I don't expect you to believe this, but a few things struck me while I was writing this. One, I felt fear even today and had to wipe away tears more than a few times to get through this. Two, the man in flannel was wearing the same thing the second time I saw him, when he was guiding me out of the woods. Moonshiners, even the dead ones, know the woods better than anyone. Third, and lastly, is this. Predatory big cats will mark their territory in a number of ways. One is to not hunt directly in the territory, but in the surrounding area much like the area surrounding our land. Needless to say, I did not hunt that year. The Howler has made quite a name for himself within the media and the stories floating around Missouri. It would feature alongside other cryptids in shows like Lost Tapes and Expedition X, which aired on Animal Planet and Discovery Channel respectively. Both shows focus on cryptids and reported run-ins with them though it's also believed the Howler is just a hoax. Cryptozoologist Chad Armit has recounted a story about him receiving emails about the Howler, but having tracked them back to a college student, he was able to get a confession from the student. Reported sightings and websites had been set up by the student to see how easily information could spread. Even so, surely not all these encounters could be made up. Not all stories are fabrications of fancy. Surely there must be something out there, lurking among the Ozarks for its next meal, or perhaps a wandering soul. In Casey's mind, he was running. His instincts took over and helped him sail effortlessly away from the beast before him. But in reality, He hadn't moved an inch, could only watch the way that some animals try to pretend they're dead to avoid predators. The shadow only got bigger and bigger the more it closed in. Soon Casey could see what looked like branches in the mist on either side of the howler's head. He took a small and scared step back, thinking of reaching for his gun and immediately wondering what good that would do. Remember his dad telling him that knowing when not to shoot is just as important. Still, the howler got closer, its huffing reminding Casey of the bulls he'd seen in cartoons. His heart could have led an army into battle with how hard it was thrumming against his ribcage. Each detail of the howler revealed he'd remember the conversations he'd had with the locals. All their descriptions were close, but all of them just missed the mark. Its eyes were glowing red, cause it didn't seem to have eyes. The red glow emitted from under the skin where the eyes should be. But Casey could see fur had grown over the sockets. It was like when you put a flashlight in the palm of your hand, allowing a red hue to glow out the other side. The howler lowered its frame, a stance that cats would often take when ready to pounce, lower front paws, and lift the back. It was certainly strong, sleek, almost panther-like, black fur wrapped around muscles that might tear fur apart if strained too much. Casey did not doubt that the beast could take a bear or two easily, especially if it was able to snag one on those horns. They looked like antlers at first, sure, but they weren't quite. No, the way grooves ran along the horns etching lines down towards the base. They looked more like individual trees were growing out the side of its head. Small, sure, but if Casey tilted his head, they'd look just like deep burgundy trees sprouting from a dead animal. It was all too real and far too sudden. Casey couldn't move, and something inside, under the ancestral instinct, There was a voice begging him to be still. He wasn't meant to be there. He was not part of the natural ecosystem. The howler stepped closer. Casey could almost feel the heat coming off of it. 
spectacularly, the fog itself seemed to dance around the howler. Though out of fear or admiration, Casey did not know. He did notice, however, that the howler wasn't looking at him. It only appeared so at first, but its gaze drifted to the left of him. There were scurrying soft feet running through tall grass, looking for a hole to vanish into. The howler let out a scream. Casey was so close that it nearly pushed him over. It felt like he would stand up too fast after hours of staring at the computer screen. Casey tried to convince himself that the scream had some kind of paralyzing effect, but he could move. Every limb refused to acknowledge this, though. The scream still, an almost ethereal mixture of a deer and welling from beyond the grave would be enough to stop anything in their tracks. Before the roar ended, the howler had pounced. Using legs thicker than Casey's torso, the howler almost vanished from his sight. It sounded like a truck crashed into a wall when the howler landed on whatever poor mammal was moving behind Casey. There were no cries from the victim, just the sound of the canopy above shaking from the impact. And slowly, the visage of the howler returned to Casey's sight. So close, he could touch it, but he dare not. The muscle mass of two grown bears, the figure of the meanest lion you'll ever see, and a strangely thin snout, like a young doe. It had something in its mouth. The animal it had pounced on, surely. But Casey couldn't make heads or tails of the critter, what was left of it. Casey did watch the mist, though. It looked like the animal in the howler's jaw was pumping out steam. The fog drifted out of the animal and danced in the air for a moment before being pulled back down and into the howler's mouth. There was a soft realization, one that allowed Casey, however foolishly, to drop his guard. He felt like he understood how the howler hunted, and in that security, he let his shoulders drop. When he did, the howler, without hesitation, swung its head hard to the right. Casey just barely managed to back away from the beast enough to dodge being gored by its horns. He did catch the weight of the living folklore when it stepped forward to shove him. The motion was so playful, like someone joking around and pushing their buddy at a sports game, but it was enough to send Casey's body flying he sailed until his back made an impact with a tree thicker than his body. Instantly, he crumbled to the forest floor. Something was broken. He couldn't tell quite what it was, but if he tried to move, his body seized up in anguish. When he was thrown, however, he managed to grab the strap of his rifle. The strap still clutched in his hand. It was the fog. Casey knew he needed to be still like making ripples in the water. He needed to manipulate the fog as little as he could. Easier said than done now, his body racked with pain. He had gone from completely healthy to demolished in seconds. Casey had never been hit by a truck, but he was confident he could now sympathize with those who had. His chest raised and lowered in ragged breaths his throat clicking like playing cards on bike tires when trying to catch a decent breath. His back was wet. The tree carved up his skin like he was Bree. Still, the howler approached, each step meaningful and strong. The ground nearly quaked as the gap between them closed. Casey wasn't looking at the howler, though. In the distance, up the hill, he could see another shape. One he had seen enough to be able to pick it up from a helicopter. A deer, a damn big one. Slow movements orchestrated the rifle. Not like Casey could move quickly if he tried, but he figured already injured, the beast wouldn't pounce on barely moving prey. No sudden movements. They both became hunters, Casey and the howler eyeing their prey, buying one more day of survival it would come down to who acted first. He didn't know if the deer innately knew the rules of the howler, 
but he had to make a gamble that he could make it break them. Once again, Casey felt the monstrous heat. He wondered if the howler crawled up from Hades itself, bringing the mist hovering over the river of sticks with it. No time for that, for daydreaming, no matter how bad the pain pulled him towards rest. Which one looks better? In his mind, he thought it was funny. Head tilted up, he looked at the figure of the deer, the howler stepping a heavy paw into his peripheral. One. His teeth were coated with sticky red mucus that jostled loose from his throat via the vibrations of his voice. Ozark's howler was upon him, standing over, ready to pull the soul from his body. Casey nudged the rifle placing the scope affixed to the top right up to his eye, revealing a closer image of the deer. Or two. A shot rang out through the trees, a bullet ripping through the ocean of fog and making a hard smacking sound reaching its destination. His vision darkened, ushered into slumber as the deer let out a howl of its own, and Casey pleaded for one more day. Still nothing. His words were steeped in exhaustion. The aches of stillness were beginning to remind him of how long he had been laying on the forest floor. His legs were cramping and his fingers were moving stiffly. He hated the thought of rising from a good spot, but he hadn't seen any worthwhile movement since he had laid down. Sun pressing against his face, finger pressed down on his emergency beacon, He was finally able to loosen his tension as he heard voices calling out for him. They had easily spot him, with not a trace of fog nearby. He screamed back as much as his lungs allowed, some ribs probably broken. His scream was matted. It shook and sounded like rocks were thrown at his throat while crying out. It was deep and victorious. And for a moment, however brief, It sounded like that monster. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Unexplained Encounters, Tales from the Break Room, and Redwood Bureau. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to CarmenCarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Until next time, stay safe out there, because this world is a strange one.